This is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. Yeah. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. It's about trout. Wild trout. This is Trout Bitten. This is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Dominic Swentoski. I'm the owner of Trout Bitten and the author of TroutBitten.com. All right, tonight we are here for a conversation about tightline leader styles. We'll share what we like best, what works for each of us, and what does not. This episode is kind of a part two for the podcast that we did two weeks ago. That one was titled Tightline, High Stick, Euronymph, Monorig. What's the difference and how did we get here? In that one, Austin and I outlined a rough history of tightline or contact nymphing styles, and we separated the terms a bit. Because when someone says, oh, monorig, high stick, check nymph, or Spanish nymphing, it's all the same thing. And that's just not true. In fact, there are enormous differences in the leader designs and even the intentions of all these tactics. So Austin and I covered that in the podcast that precedes this one. And while it's not absolutely required, I do recommend listening to that one even if you are very familiar with all this stuff already. So we covered a lot last time, and we won't try to do that again here. While the last topic was more about the leader designs themselves, this week the conversation is focused on how we use these leaders. Also, yes, we've covered monorig tactics before, in full podcasts, in articles, and in Troutpit and YouTube videos. And I'll leave links to the important resources that precede this, because they very much set up this discussion. This specific topic, though, is one we've never really had before. How do we fish different leader builds for tightlining? What are the advantages and disadvantages of standard, thin, and micro-thin monorigs? So let's define the terms a bit, because that's important. Standard, thin, and micro-thin. That's what we're calling them tonight. And as we pointed out last week, there are similarities but major differences in these leaders and the fishing styles. Honestly, I think we covered that well last week. But let me quickly set up this discussion and these terms for our conversation. In the trout bitten shop, we sell what I call standard, thin, and micro-thin mono rigs. These will be back in stock uh, the day after Thanksgiving for the fall leader sale. And we do this four times a year. So these are the same leaders I've fished for a very long time. These guys have too. But you can and should tie your own leaders too. You'll make adaptations and find what you like. And the formulas for all those trout bitten leaders are also on the website in many places. But no matter what you end up with, I think it's fair to say that each leader, everything you're using, can be classified as micro thin, thin, or what I call standard, that being the thickest version. So what matters most in a tight line leader design is what's hanging out of the guides, what's in the air, what leads to the flies. For me, and for most tight line anglers I know, the butt section matters most. I strongly prefer to keep knots out of the guides, so I use a long butt section and short taper, allowing for an unbroken piece of mono, sailing through the guides with ease, a lot like a fly line. Defining these terms a little bit more then, the butt section of a standard mono rig build is 20 pound, or around 0.017 inches. I'd say you can get a similar performance with something a little thinner, like 15 pound, I'd still call that a standard build, but thinner than that, and you get into the range of a thin mono rig. So 12 pound or 10 pound being around 0.012 for the butt section fills the thin roll. And then there's micro thin leader designs, which are basically anything thinner than that. So around eight pound, but especially six pound leader builds and under. I'd definitely call any leader built of 2X or thinner for the butt section a micro thin monorig. Again, there's some crossover in these terms, I suppose. Now, if you're into this stuff, then I know you're with me. But if you're not and you're getting a little lost, then this all might sound pretty crazy. Again, if you are lost, go catch up with the previous podcast and the other resources linked there too. Didn't leave you hanging. There's plenty of ways to kind of catch up to this conversation. So to summarize, we're using these names as a reference in tonight's discussion, and the trout bitten leaders are built from 20 pound maximum chameleon for the standard, 10 pound for the thin, and 5 pound for the micro thin. 20, 10, 5. There you go. That should make sense. Now, Austin and I mentioned last week that we get more questions regarding tight line or monorig leader builds and performance than anything else. And here's why. Right now, a majority of the tight line community seems to have followed down the same trail of micro thin monorigs. And I mean it. 
Almost every educator is telling you why the micro-thin or Spanish nymphing leader is wonderful and you have to use it. But they often forget to point out the drawbacks. They're also not reminding you about the deadly effectiveness of these other leader builds as well. Everything is good. Everything works sometimes. All right, now I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not saying anything is bad information. I'm saying that the picture that many anglers are receiving is often incomplete. And I know that firsthand. People are confused. Like we said in the last episode, it can seem like this whole space of tight line nymphing has moved in one direction very quickly. That's confusing to a lot of anglers. And it leaves us, trout bitten, as one of the only resources trying to emphasize the versatility of a standard mono rig build or point out the failings and the strengths of all these styles. Everything works sometimes. I think that's fair. And so we get these questions a lot, and we're happy to answer them. That's what we're here to do tonight. Guys, let's dig into this. I'll introduce each of you as you start talking so everyone can know who they disagree with. Deli, you want to go? <laughs> you should say something first because <laughs> everybody's going to disagree with you. Um, everybody ready? Yes. All right. Did I miss anything in the intro? Did And you probably listened to the last podcast, right? Did Austin and I miss anything from last week? What do you think? Yeah. What did Dominic miss? Yeah. Come on. I can't now. remember you guys talking about the role. <laughs> Here's Trevor Smith, Dr. Trevor yeah. Smith right here. The role that the rod plays depending upon which style you're going to choose. Because I, my own personal take on that, I think that the rod, having a good rod matters more if you're going to fish a micro leader or a rod that's really specifically designed to do what you need it to do with the micro thin leaders, mono rigs makes a bigger difference than it would. I think there's more forgiveness in rod choice with the standard 20 pound butt. That's fair. And so I, I just wonder whether people, so, you know, you have some people out there that are fishing like a 9.5 or a, a 10.5 even with a standard mono rig that are going to try mm -hmm. to switch over to a micro thin leader and potentially really struggle with lack of sensitivity or lack of ability to really be accurate. So, yeah, I don't know. A lot of times when I'm see, watching the instructors that are out there that are proposing these micro thin leaders, they're fishing on two weights or 11 foot rods or just really lightweight rods. Yep. Um, and maybe that's not true, but that's just been my perception. And I think it is, I think it's easier to cast. Here's Bill Dell. A Delly. thinner butt section with a more flexi rod, like a three weight and under. And I think you can do it with the other rods, but I think for the average angler, it's much easier because with that slower rod, you can feel the rod flex, where if you have a five weight, you might not necessarily feel the rod flex with like a an eight pound butt section. It mm -hmm. does, but if you're not in tune with that tool you know that 10 foot five weight or a nine foot five weight that's a, a stiffer rod if you're not used to like where it where it loads yeah and then you try to put something on it that is you know not going to cause it to load as much it's actually going to hinder your ability to catch fish because your casts are going to get worse mm, for sure i agree and disagree with you guys I agree that, especially if you're learning, if you want to learn to cast light stuff, I think it's harder uh, on a four weight, or especially on a five weight. Granted, then that you go to the two weight and you're going to go, oh, that's, that's loading for me. But I've been telling my clients this, it's up to you to load the rod. Stop waiting for the leader to load the rod. Stop waiting for the fly to load the rod, even the fly line. It's up to you to load the rod. That's what I say. So it's speed in between two points and crisp stops. And with that, you know, you've, you've all done it. You've picked up a rod without a line or leader or anything attached and flexed it, cast it, flexed it. Uh, granted, different thing, right? But like with that casting stroke, it sails right out there. I don't care. So I don't, I don't change my, uh, personally, right? I don't change my rod. I don't say, oh, I'm just going to fish a micro today. So I'm going to fish a, a three weight or a two weight. The reason I've chosen the 10 foot four weight as my favorite tool is because it can do everything. Even though, and we'll get into this, even though the micro thin stuff is a very specialized leader for me i don't believe it needs a specialized rod if if you are very comfortable with the different casts already yeah tough to learn on though it's good points 
Um, listening back, I just had another thought uh, mm-hmm. to our conversation. Well, here's Austin Dando. When we were discussing the difference between fishing different poundages of butt sections mm-hmm. at the very end of the episode. And then I got to thinking again about what micro is. Yeah. And if we think about micro in terms of a five pound butt section, sure. and we think about micro in terms of a six or a seven X butt hmm. section, can we call those things even the same anymore? Like one guy may be fishing a micro that's five pound. One guy may be fishing a micro that's seven X. Mm-hmm. Are those experiences going to transfer? I mean, what makes Sorry. us think we can call them both mm-hmm. micro leaders? They're not the same. You need an ultra light. Yeah. Super micro. <laughs> Super micro. Hyper light. Disappearing micro. Or something. Invisible. I don't know. <laughs> Invisible micro. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that's beyond it is, micro to me. Right? It's the end of the line. Like we said before, for me, as soon as you lose that ability to stand there and cast that line like a fly line, you're into the micro range. Even the thin can, is going to struggle. Bill and I were talking about this the other day around your ping pong table, Trevor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that uh, the thin for me kind of straddles, you know, the difference between what standard can do and what micro can do. And I don't use the thin much um, because I feel like I don't have the benefit of either one of those things. Um, the thin can kind of cast itself like a fly line. We say this a lot. I've said this a hundred times that the standard monorig can cast like a fly line if you treat it that way and we stand there and cast it without any weight on without any nymphs on we do that that is the biggest thing to remember that's the biggest difference that's why i choose it not for any aesthetic but because it can mend itself in the air because it can tuck and provide grace and slack in all the right ways that's why i love it the most and then once i lose that performance i'd call it a micro rig like almost completely lose that performance austin yeah That performance, I guess, leads me to my first thought is that if I want to fish all of a river, Mm. like I want to fish a a half mile river and I want to fish all the water types that half mile has to offer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, maybe the fish of the day is in a slower section or a tail out or something like that. And in that, if you're doing something that's going to limit your ability to fish a certain water type, you're still going to catch fish because you, you can say, okay, well, I, this one rig works for this specific water type. And so you're going to walk and pass up maybe a hundred yards of river. And so when you pass that up, you might be passing up the biggest fish, or you might be passing up the section that has the most fish in it because your rig is not adaptable to that. So why would you pass it up? I, I don't get that yet. So let's say I was fishing a micro leader and it was a five pound butt section. Yeah. And I got to a big flat section of river. Mm-hmm. That micro, one thing I probably, I probably wouldn't trust it to throw like a head banger or a, any type of articulated streamer on it okay. at distance because I've fished kind of those thinner rigs and I've broken several fish off trying to fish streamers with them like the butt section breaks mm-hmm. and so five x yeah. yeah or five, or even five i'm saying like five even and five eight pound, pound. yeah um yeah. i've broken off that butt section um it's not going to cast as well like you talked about like the thicker butt sections will allow you to cast at distance and your fly doesn't have to be weight if mm-hmm. if i want to cast good point let's say i want to cast 35 feet Mm-hmm. because I'm I, that's a big wide river and I need to reach the other bank. I can do that with like a five or an eight pound butt section, but I have to do it with something very heavy mm-hmm. because yeah. I need some mass to get it there. So I might have to fish like a, a five millimeter bead, mm. but then when I work that fly back, Ooh, yeah. I don't have the ability to stall it out yep. because mm-hmm. that, that 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 bead as soon as i slow it down it's just going to shrink to the bottom mm. and so it limits my ability on that retrieve especially with streamer fishing in like slower waters i think it's a great example I, and we all kind of went oh yeah yeah because it might not even have to be a five millimeter bead even a three millimeter bead on a mm-hmm. woolly bugger or something is gonna yeah well it might be heavier than you want it to be and your grinch for example is is lighter than that it's built to be cast and to have a very slow sink rate but it yeah. needs it often needs the push the punch of a thicker leader to push it out there 
And that's the difference. That's the difference. The I've often said the standard build is like a hybrid system. It'll do many different things like a fly line and they do other things like the micro rig or like a spinning rod, like a, like a spin setup, yeah. gear setup. I mean, I just think like what brings us all to the mono rig in the first place is the versatility that it offers, right? That's why I'm not for fishing. Us. Yeah, for us. And that's why we don't predominantly fish fly line. That's why we don't predominantly fish any other tactic 90% of the time or 85% of the time of the year when we're underneath right we're fishing the standard mono rig with a 20 pound butt and the reason that we do that is because of the versatility it offers and so i think for me the decision i completely agree with you i don't think that's a val- i don't think that the decision is like that the micro mono rig is bad i don't i think that's no. too reductionist of an argument yes. i just think that it's a less versatile tool and because it's a less versatile tool, it finds itself on our terminal line less often. And mm-hmm. I think that's kind of as simple as it, or as complex as it needs to be in some regards. You know, it doesn't mm-hmm. it doesn't mean there isn't the right time and place for it. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have some things. And and you can't argue that it has less sag, right? It, mm-hmm. it definitely right. has less sag. But to Bill's point, I don't want to be changing out my leaders throughout the river on the majority of our days and the water that we fish here offers us the opportunity if you're looking for it and able to take advantage of it to fish streamers nymphs sometimes dry dry dropper all within three four hours of a day Mm -hmm. um, much of the year not all the year but much of the year and and having a rig for us that matches that ability is really important to tie the best flies you need the best materials With decades of commercial fly tying experience, Fooling Mill understands what it takes to tie a great fly. Over the past several years, they've worked hard to source and prepare a range of fly tying materials that will elevate your experience at the vise. Fooling Mill fly tying materials have arrived with a range of over 1,400 products. You'll find the staples like marabou, bucktail, and rabbit sonker strips. You'll also find CDC, stripped peacock quills, 12 dubbing ranges, synthetics, chenilles, yarns, and wools. All fooling mill materials come in an extensive range of colors that are consistently dyed. So what you receive from them tomorrow will be the same color next year. Their materials go through a rigorous quality control process. So before they're packaged and shipped out, you can be sure they're up to the highest quality standards. Ask for fooling mill fly tying materials at your local dealer or find them online at foolingmill.com. Precision Fly and Tackle is a family-owned business with a passion for the outdoors and a sense of adventure. They are anglers who enjoy every moment spent on the water with family and friends. Precision Fly and Tackle carries the widest selection of Euro rods, reels, lines, leaders, flies, and accessories. From the beginner to the advanced angler, Precision Fly and Tackle can outfit every angler, no matter the budget. Visit them online at precisionflyandtackle.com. Then use code TROUTBITTEN10, that's the number 10, for 10% off your order. Gear up with Precision Fly and Tackle for your next adventure. Can I tie this together then with a question? And I get this question a lot, so I'm like speaking through the audience here. This is good. People will ask me, well then, why does the whole competition scene use the micro rig right now? And I think it's fair, not the whole, I'm sure there's other guys doing other things, but why do almost all of the competition fishermen right now fish a micro mono rig or a Spanish nymphy leader, you know, a real, real thin setup, a real thin light setup? Why are they all doing that? Aren't they, Bill, trying to cover all the water? I mean, they have a beat that's one or 200 yards long. Don't they have to cover all of that? I don't know enough about the competition scene to say, are they, are these beats, you know, I've seen them on some of our rivers or, you know, I watched one long time. It must have been a decade ago. Mm-hmm. And they were all set up in nymphing water. Okay. All the beats. But I don't know if that's always the case. I'm guessing yeah, not it's probably always. not. Some are much better than others. Yeah, sure. You could get You're going to have flat, flat water. Yeah. yeah. Flats and pools and riffles and runs. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting question, Dom. Here's Grobe. Matt Grobe. Like, where did it derive from? Right, because if it derived from the competition scene and it's getting spread mainstream more recently, right, then somebody within that circuit in a particular waterway felt like it was an added advantage, right? Yeah. And so I would say that's got to be somewhat specified, like 
the advantage. Like I've, I tried fishing eight pound two years ago and I've never fished it again. Mm. Right. And I fish a lot <laughs> yeah. and like never see the benefit of going that low for the waters I fish. Like I, I I'm with, with Trevor, like I want to be versatile and did Bill mention breaking stuff off? I can't tell you how many times I've snapped eight and six pound yeah. micro thin liters. Um, and I was like, hell with that, man. That's just like, what's the point? I was getting mm. frustrated and I just don't see any application in, in my game that that benefits, right? That's interesting. That, uh, I just, so I don't even, I would go with the standard. I fish a 15 pound. Yeah, um, I know. That's, yeah. that's my jam and. I just never look back and maybe I should open that door again, but I got frustrated fishing that tiny micro thin stuff, whether it would be coiling or mm. snapping. I think snapping was my biggest issue with that yeah, stuff. Yeah. And I, I had fished it in the winter and I feel like that stuff's more prone of snapping. Uh, mm, it fair, really fair. Yeah. It'll cool. coil less though. It'll coil less. I think that's one benefit of the micro rig is uh, it coils less. You don't have to, you know, thicker leader holds a coil more. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, it doesn't yeah. suit your waters. You're just saying it doesn't it's, suit your yeah. waters. Well, your applications. I think that's a good point because Matt fishes, like all the all the demos and all the all the folks that have been, that I, at least videos that I have seen, have been doing this on smaller waterways. Mm. And so I don't, like, my, my other thing is like scalability. Is it durable? We know that it's not durable. Can it handle a heavy fish? or a very big fish in that bigger waterway. So like Matt's fishing, like the majority of his rivers are probably double our size. And so, oh, at least, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe well, it's, the CFS is higher. I mean, right. Our, yeah, our yeah. low CFS is a thousand. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, yeah. yeah. Right. And so that, that current speed out there and trying to move and get those fish in compared to yep. some of these waterways that, you know, I've seen some of the, the competitions that have been in our area, like, are they, are they on smaller waterways consistently? And then that rig is a little bit more adaptable because you're not putting as much strain on it as if you were fishing in Yellowstone river. Yeah. Yeah. I like, let that. me pose I, this question. Do we think it's because it's easier to get a dead drift on it than it is say a 15 pound or 20 pound, butt? is it simply easier? Yeah. Is that all I don't it know is? If I agree with like with how is it easier? Figure. That's so, the question. I think it's easier. I don't I mean, know how it would be easier. How how is it though? I don't okay, think. Okay, I think. Go ahead, Trevor. I think you have less counterforce. So if yeah. you have less counterforce, you're not sagging, you're not dragging, you don't have the potential of dragging. But it's really more about like at what distance can you have create that dead right. drift, right? right because on. within ten feet, I think you could probably <laughs> argue that it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Um, but twenty feet to thirty feet. Maybe maybe you see a difference there. Huh. Yeah. There's a lot here. There really is. There's a lot here. And to be honest, I, I feel like we'll get to the end of this. We'll only scratch the surface. And you know me. I'm a leader guy, and I'm all, I, I love getting into these techniques and these tactics. And everybody, these are the main questions I get all the time. And to try to break it down, especially with you guys and all your input, um, is something I'm kind of – I've been looking forward to this. Austin, your, your question, is it easier? To me, yes. It's A micro rig is easier to get it true dead drift on if that's what you're aiming for it's easier let's say this to be to have less influence over your flies it's easier to have less influence over your fly and now we've taught i've mentioned before i won't go down this rabbit hole too much but there are three different ways to get a dead drift you can just do what i call tracking the flies throw it in there just track their progress try really hard not to influence the flies and that's very much i think what a micro rig specializes in i think that's what it does best for me that's when I use it the most. And I use it, I use it a lot right now because I want to see why everybody likes it, right? And there's a few applications that I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that micro rig on or I'm just going to lighten up my system. Anyway, tracking the flies. The second way is strike zone rides, which is kind of my favorite thing to do. You're trying to hit like six, 10, not even 12 inch tall uh, buffer on the bottom, of that, that bottom current seam, the strike zone. I'm trying to just glide my nymphs through and not touch, ideally, just glide through the strike zone. If I want to get a strike zone ride, then I'd much rather get it through the column quickly and then glide through. Now, in that case, I need to have some influence over the fly to kind of keep it there so it doesn't drop. The third way is to really bottom bounce. 
and you can tick to tick tick and we've gone over all this too i think that the micro rig allows you to do really all three of those but it really does best in that tracking the flies and to your point or to your question austin yeah i think it's easier to do that with a micro rig than a standard because at that point the flies are heavier than your rig most cases. Well, because at that because there's less sag, like like Trevor pointed out. Let's say we're fishing at twenty five feet away, because that's the other thing. I said there's a lot I mean, we know there's yeah. a lot to this. Yeah. If you're fishing fifteen feet away, it doesn't matter what you use. Yes. You could have a thirty pound butt section. I agree. And you are with let's say you got a ten foot rod. So instead of saying feet and you know what we should probably talk about rod length. If you are one rod length away, it doesn't matter. If you're right underneath your rod tip, there's no rods, there's no leader sag, you know? Yeah. If you're two rod, and follow me on this, if you're two rod lengths away and you're fishing, let's say 25 centigrams or a number 14 with a, uh, with a three millimeter bead, right? Then at the very beginning, there could be a little sag with a standard leader, but that's why we tuck cast. But if you throw the micro rig in, then I'm with you, Austin. It's easier to just put it in with everything being, assuming too that things are real thin underneath. You got like a 6X underneath, 6X or less. Exactly. Then yeah. it doesn't matter to tuck cast. And the effect then of the current is much less. Hell, you can even sometimes cross seams a little bit. It doesn't matter. There's more forgiveness on the mm -hmm. micro rig. So that's a two rod lengths away. If you go to three rod lengths away, you're kind of in trouble with a standard mono rig with, a, with 25 centigrams out there. If you go up to like 75 centigrams, now you have enough counterweight. Now you're built out. Balance, you know, like, like yeah. Bill said. Now you're building. <laughs> no, but like you said, Bill, it's, uh, it's the mass of the leader out there. And, but anyway, you can counterweight it with the uh, extra weight, the 75 centigrams out there. But if you're three rod lengths away, at that point, I mean, is the micro rig can throw it out there three rod lengths away and kind of pretty quickly start with a good dead, a decent dead drift. Go ahead, Matt. Sorry. That's all right. But at what point, okay, or w what conditions are you in mm -hmm. where you have to cast a micro rig three mm -hmm. rod lengths away is my, know. is my first question to you guys. So like what, what, none. what conditions? Almost none. When you're not allowed to use a bobber. <laughs> well, <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> to That's be completely really honest. Because I'm right, yeah. Austin. When you're not allowed to use a, any indicator. And I was thinking yeah. spoot, maybe like when the condition, like late, late summer, like sp high sun conditions where you're trying to reach. Mm. Stay behind them. So yeah. Body position eliminates a lot of a need for, for that. As you were speaking to that, all I could think of was different angle, like different body position. Yeah. Like, and, and it eliminates the need for that micro leader at that I'm point. with you. Yeah, so maybe that helps answer the uh, competition question, you know, it does. With, with those constraints, right? You have a tool that can all of a sudden. Yeah, I mean, that's great, great answer to Austin. <laughs> you know our buddy Alex Argos, who comments a lot mm -hmm. on Trout yeah. yeah. He emailed me the other day with a good question. And he said, so if you were a competition fisherman, would you fish a microliter? And I don't know if anybody ever asked me that. I've had people say, well, if all you wanted to do is tight line nymph, would you fish a microliter? And if you didn't care about adding the indie, if you didn't care about dry dropper or going to streamers or even throwing single small dries on the standard mono rig, would you just fish a microliter then? Um, if you just wanted to just tight line nymph with medium to lightweight nymphs. And I always said before, no, I'd use the standard. We can talk about that because I'd tuck it in and float the cider. But <laughs> there's so much to it, right? Uh, but Alex's question, if I was competing, I probably would. I'd probably throw a microliter because we just have to remember that they are under restrictions. Like Austin said, they cannot add an indie. They cannot add split shot. And the biggest one, I think, I think the most consequential thing is that leader cannot be longer than two times the rod length. And that Euro fly line is actually pretty heavy compared to what a mono rig is. Can they do dry dropper? Sure, they can do dry dropper, but you and you and I both know that that's not nearly as a, as effective as uh, throwing like a yarn indie. Gotcha. Being able to slide it up and down, suspend more weight. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious if they could do like a big chubby. It's, yeah, yeah. Know, they, sure, they can. And they have yeah. all kinds of flies like that that'll kind of substitute. <laughs> they for don't that, do but that. It, it's not adjustable yeah. up and down, right? Sure. Yeah, it's uh, that. I mean, 
that's a cool question to th- you know if you were in their shoes would you would you use it and then it kind of goes into like what application are you teaching you're getting all these questions right and who knows yeah. what the you know i don't want to you know assume but you know most of, some of these people aren't probably very well versed in fishing in general right and i think it's somewhat sketchy to start putting novice anglers even intermediate anglers on a rig like that hmm. and you start seeing christmas tree stuff in the trees because it snaps <laughs> oh, easier yeah. yeah and fish are you know have hooks in their mouths and and you know you gotta i think you gotta watch that personally because most people don't understand the finesse piece of the of this application because i do think there's a finesse piece to it so do you think there's more finesse to a micro rig than a standard rig I do. Now, what do you mean by finesse? I think you have to be more gentle. You have to understand how to play a fish. You might have mm-hmm. to understand mm-hmm. when yeah. you're unhooking a snag or if you're in a tree and you want to be more aggressive to get your flies out because you know if you pull on it, it's going to snap. Like, and, and I take that for granted. We take that for granted. But a lot of people, some novice anglers I go out on the water with are really hammering on the snag. Right, yeah. and it's like, well, yeah, yeah. you better watch. You better be mindful because you're you're, you're fish, fishing a, mo- a a micro leader yeah. or fighting fish. I think, you know, whatever nine to thirteen inch fish, probably not a big deal, right? But you yeah, start that's... getting into some nice fish. I mean, you're 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 gonna get go for a ride, and I don't yeah. think people understand how to properly fight fish on that light tackle. That's a good point. It does take more finesse in that way. Seems like the only kind of hey, here's darling, Josh darling. Well, yeah, I was gonna say, but it seems like the only area that it requires more finesse is after the flies are in the water because before when you're casting it's the exact opposite hmm. right i mean you have to tell us you more. Have to, well you have to you really have to force it because and we've talked a lot about the power that a standard has and anything bigger than a standard has but as soon as you start taking off you obviously lose power in mm-hmm. the actual material and so where you can kind of make somewhat finesse like casts with a standard mono rig as mm-hmm. long as you have the speed you lose that ability really quickly as you Hmm. decrease the size of that leader. And so it's like you have to be really aggressive with your cast in order to get it to go where it's supposed to go. And then you have to be really finesse with it as soon as it's in the water. That's very interesting. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. That's a good distinction too between the casting and the drifting. Sorry, Trevor. That's okay. Yeah, no, I just think it's really tough to be accurate with that micro leader because, I mean, in the standard mono rig, you have this designed turnover occurring mm-hmm. yeah. in a controlled way that produces accuracy. But with the micro leader, this miniature taper and sometimes not even a taper oh, no, right. results in this kind of inconsistent and early turnover. I don't know. It creates like an odd arm of cast to me, I don't, at least in yeah. my work with it that I found really difficult to be accurate with. The really, really thin, like we're talking five pounds and under, Mm. a lot of times that cast becomes a little bit more of a lob. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that lob is not always the easiest to Mm -hmm. get the right trajectory you need to get under trees or to get into into the right position. Like you're Mm. you're kind of it's handicapping you a little. Or cast into a breeze, right? Or yeah. Anything like that. Right. So not too long ago, Josh and I did a video, I call it round in the corner, right? And with a fly line, you can round the corner 90 degrees. You can have your back cast well back there and then round the corner 90 degrees. Your back cast is parallel with the river. And then you can cast across, you can deliver across the river. Show that in a video. I think most anglers kind of just happen upon that once you fish long enough. That's totally possible with a fly line. Totally possible. With a standard rig, you can kind of go halfway there. You, you can round a corner about 45 degrees. And I've paid attention to this. With a micro leader, and I think everybody would agree with this, you're surrendering to the concept of 180 degrees. Wherever your back cast is, you must then deliver 180 degrees almost exactly. That's where it's going to go. That, that 180 degree concept is what you're, well, surrendered to. That's what you're limited to. And so I kind of take issue when people say that you, it's not as accurate. And I would agree with that. It, at first, you're not going to be as accurate with a micro rig. Um, and I certainly wasn't. But I've, I've done this a lot now. I was doing it today. 
I, I never put my standard leader on for the last two days at all. I'm all micro. I knew we were going to do this podcast too. And so I've been Ooh. like you, Bill. Hell, I had a three X or four X on fish my on micro rig today. <laughs> Bill yeah. had three X the other day. <laughs> it's, just, it's an eight pound butt. <laughs> it is. It's an eight pound butt <laughs> section. It comes to the cider. So, you know, Mix, that's, the, yeah, right. that's the new yeah. school. And then, you know, when the cider, it meets the tippet and the tippet's three X and that's old school. Yeah. So it's all in one, all in one rig. <laughs> So I'm saying that once I got used to it, I could very. I feel like I can be just as accurate as I want to be, even under trees and everything. There is not as much room for versatility in how I might want to cast. You kind of have one cast <laughs> that'll get you in there. I do feel like I yeah. accuracy again is up to the angler. It's not up to the rod either. It's it's up to you. You know to be to to know your tool. And once you are, I'm sure we're going to have people out there that say I could be deadly accurate with my five X rig. You know, I'm sure they are. As fly anglers and tires, we understand the value of having the right tool for the job. AvidMax.com offers over 20,000 products and the knowledge to help you find the right tool for your job, whether that be at the tying bench or on the water. Listeners of the Trout Pitten Podcast receive a special one-time discount code at AvidMax.com. Enter the code TB10 at checkout on full-priced items to save 10% off your order. Orders over $25 ship for free, so you can put more gas in your tank or beer in your cooler. For all things fly fishing and tying, elevate your game with Avid Max. For over a decade, Smith Creek's high quality fly fishing accessories have helped anglers just like you to keep your gear in easy reach, free up your hands, and keep our waters clean. Their award winning Rod Clip Plus now has two ways to attach it to your vest or pack making it easier to tie a fly, change a hook, or release your catch. All Smith Creek products are built guide tough, using rugged materials, and backed by their strong commitment to customer service. This fall, Smith Creek is introducing even more new products, so keep checking their website at smithcreek.co for more information and special offers from now through Christmas. The other thing is your one overhand knot away from losing any fish bigger than 12 inches with that. If you think about how many times the average angler gets an overhand knot in their leader, in their tippet, like I see it a lot guiding and I've even done it. I've done it. I do it myself, you know, maybe two or three times a day where I get that overhand knot in something and that overhand knot. If you're fishing like a four X butt section, even like a five pound butt section, that overhand knot could be the undoing of, you know, you learned to tie that overhand knot as a kid, and now, yeah, it's going to wreck your day. I think it's funny. Bill keeps going back to, this might lose me a big fish. <laughs> and Matt, you're yeah, kind of saying the same thing. I'm not, like, I'm like fishing for five-inch trout. Yep. Well, yeah. back to the comp I, scene thing. That's why they don't, they're not caring in the competition about landing the biggest trout. They're caring about landing the right. most trout. They want numbers. Yeah. Mm. So let's highlight a couple things. Which is easier to cast? The and again, we're kind of skipping over the thin, right? It, which is in the middle. But we're talking about the extremes, let's say. So which is easier to cast, the standard or the micro? There's a difference between casting and drifting, like Josh said. Standard. Standard. Hmm. Should we all say it? Standard. Huh. Yeah, I like... I like uh, hmm. <laughs> you trying to make this a trick question? I'm trying to Let think, think like about this. I feel like standard. sometimes if it's... <laughs> <laughs> if I'm lobbing heavy nymphs, yeah. it could be easier to cast the thin. Like I feel like it's just super easy to just lob lob it over my shoulder, just sling it out, plunk there. it in in a riffle, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you put any environmental factors into it with wind or anything mm. like that, I'm going standard, which goes back to the versatility piece. Yeah, because I don't have to have perfect conditions to go out to fish daily. Like I I, I want to know I'm. I don't want to look at the wind. I just want to go fish. Well, so that's right. that's another yeah. thing to bring up. I mean, I, you're going to die in the wind with a micro rig if you also have light flies on. If you have a light rig and light flies, you have no weight to beat the wind. I was getting killed yesterday on one of our favorite rivers. And then I was like, all right, I can't fish this single 16. It, there's no weight. There's no weight to combat it. And yeah, I could float the cider for a second yeah. or two seconds for the whole thing. But man, you just couldn't power it through. The, the wind was in front of me. There's no weight. At some point, it's just physics or whatever it is, Trevor. And you just can't, <laughs> you just can't get it out there. I don't care how good the cast is. You can't get it out there in the way that you want, right? So then you have to add weight. And then you're defeating the purpose anyway. 
What's the difference in the casting though? Austin. Right on. So this is what I want to, I was going to just mention this. Oftentimes when we hear about the micro thin leader and the casting stroke and, and things like that, we, we get a disservice to ourselves in the angling community where the, the actual cast is not described in the micro rig as it actually is being used. Mm, go ahead. So, so what we are seeing and what the way that this rig is often fished is by water hauling it, a micro yeah, rig I'm water referring load, to, yeah, water haul. which is by casting your uh, leader downstream, letting the river take the tension uh, into the rig and then transferring that with a, you know, a, a forward motion of the rod tip and delivering it into mm -hmm. the riffle. Kind of low a lot of times. Yeah, that's how that these five pound or less butt sections are being fished very right. often. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about when we say casting is actual fly line style casting. And we just, I can't hit that home hard enough here. Right. That there is a distinct difference in how the fly is actually delivered. They're not the same. They're not. And it's, uh, it's possible to cast the micro rig. And again, I'm going to get into the details. If you have more than 25 centigrams, you, you don't have to just sling it. You don't have to just water haul it back there. Agree. And then sling it up or saucer cast it up. You can, you can cast it. And you can even get something like a tuck. You can get a fly first entry. So it's kind of like a tuck cast. You can get a fly first entry with 25 centigrams and more, which is, again, a number 14 or, or bigger. But if you're fishing two 18s and a 20 or something mm -hmm. like that, then, then it changes, It right? does. And then you have to water haul. And that you'll see this all the time. I see it more and more and more. And I think, I mean, I've gotten good at it. I can water haul and do that when I want. I understand the benefit of it. Um, also understand the limitations of it. I wrote an article about why I hate the water haul. <laughs> I don't like having to be pinned to that all day or for like my main tactic. You're spending a lot of time looking behind you instead of where your target is. You're spending a lot of time setting up the next cast instead of just back cast, forward cast, right back in. Real quick, are you saying you can't water haul and tuck cast at the same time? Yes. Because I, I, I feel like I do that a lot. What I'm saying is you can't water haul and truly... You can get fly first. You can get a fly first entry, absolutely. Yeah. But you can't get that aerial mend, which is kind of what that tuck cast is to yeah. actually give it some gotcha. grace to get it gotcha. you, can, you can get a real shallow angle tuck cast how about that yeah i agree yeah and look it's not easy right i mean I'm no and even that's like, not easy right it's not easy it's it's i find myself doing that at times and maybe it's because i don't have a good back cast mm -hmm. approach and i'm going you know left-handed across my body but i often use that as a technique mm -hmm. if i'm close to a bank with heavy brush and I'm casting upstream over right my, on. you know, with my left shoulder, allowing that weight of the river, you know, all my shit flies down below me. And then mm -hmm. I cast straight upstream and do a small tuck. I find mm -hmm. myself doing that during runoff here a lot because I'm forced to the bank. So yeah. I apply those tactics a lot, but I'm forced into it and I don't have a lot of freedom to move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I should clarify too, Matt, that, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to water haul. No, no. sure. 100%. And the only thing I want to uh, differentiate is how the fly is delivered. I'm not saying one way is a wrong way to do it. Sure, or one way is sure, a better sure, way sure. to do it. But. There's a lot of wrong ways to do it, though. I get what you're saying, right? There's a small percentage of situations where it could be beneficial. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I just, I just feel like said that's one. That's not of them. explained. <laughs> right. right. Right on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just like to be able to do everything. You know, I, I don't like to be limited. We've been through that a hundred times. That versatility is the is the fun thing to me. And part of that is, hey, I'll, t I'll take the standard off and put the micro on. I'll do that when the action's slow. And I'll go, well, I got something to change and keep me focused. That's one of the main reasons that I'll do that. I think what it boils down to for me, I've been trying to think of diff different ways to put it. The thinner leaders simply extend that tight line range, that, that pure tight lining range. But like Matt said, Agree. do I need to fish more than two and a half rod lengths away? Hardly ever, you know? More than three, there's big consequences to that. We'll do a whole podcast someday on like why you don't need to fish further away and every, how everything falls apart the further out you go. So I've been fishing. I've been fishing, uh, I guess, by your means. I've been fishing micro. I've been fishing eight-pound tests for probably the last five outings. Yeah, because you knew this podcast was coming. Now, I know you've done it before. Yeah, because you're a jerk and you texted me. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you know, jerk and texted me like, <laughs> I'm like, hey, we're going to do it. I'm like, all right, well, I got to fish it and remember why I hate it. <laughs> and so, but uh, hmm. what I've tried to do is take it to different sized rivers. Sure. 
purposely. And I do think, so we've talked about the, a lot of the disadvantages, but there is, right on. I, I have noticed some advantages yes, to it. Please. So like I fish some of the, one of the biggest rivers around that I fish and I was able to tight line at a longer distance. So I fished a, a 10 foot six, three weight. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to, that, that longer rod, the, the thinner butt section, it allowed me to cast further and to get like, I'm talking, I don't know, I'm probably at like 30 feet tight lining. I did notice a big difference yeah. in the, in the lack of sag. Where I kind of disagree a little bit with like the formulas that I've seen, I didn't like it at like 5X or at like 6X. You mean because, tippet, tippet or butt Yeah, section. the tippet. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. No, the tippet. And so the reason is, is if you have that thinner butt section, mm. then you have more time to allow that fly to sink. Mm. And so your tippet, yes, it does have an effect on it, but I think... I'm guessing that butt section has a bigger impact because with that butt section, if it's, if you don't have that pullback of that thicker butt section, then you're allowing you, you give that tippet time to get down and that. you don't ne- you don't have to do like any of these rigs. Like there's no like set in stone you fish, a five, you know, right. a, a five pound butt section. You have to fish five X, six X. Of course not. You don't, you just have to, you know, understand what the limitations are, but do it yourself and do it with different tippet, do it with different butt sections and find out like there's, there's a happy median where everyone is probably comfortable with. That's great advice. Experiment. I also think we always have to continually acknowledge that there's a little bit of two conversations, which is one, like what's our preferred method, which is what we're going to go with more often. And we're sort of all defending why we maybe like the standard mono rig over the micro. But mm-hmm. then there's also the, we're not trying to say it's an either or proposition, right? We've not said that a few times. And I think we'll probably need to remind people listening because I'm sure some comments will reflect the fact that we are, we're taking a clear defined side um, in some regards. And there is going to be people out there that prefer the micro for some reasons, and they may fish differently than we do, and they may have different prerogatives or different priorities when it comes to their versatility and the waterways they fish. But Mm -hmm. I think... But they're wrong. But they're wrong. (laughs) Exactly. says they're wrong. (laughs) You can get six anglers like us to agree. They they fish Tinkara. (laughs) Elitists. So I... But I think if you're strictly out to nymph fish, maybe six inches of water to two feet of water you know the depth of that Mm. all day and that's all you're going to tight line nymph there's probably a and and you're gonna and you want to throw a little bit further distance you go further there is probably some advantage to fishing thinner now does it have to be 5x does it have to be five pound that's where like you have to you know at what point are you saying it's okay if I hook the biggest fish of the year and I break it off. <laughs> He's back to that. I don't want to lose my big if one. I, but and it's I, I've <laughs> lost great. so this year I've lost four big fish trying to like messing around with the thin stuff. And that's why it's you know that's why it's here's, it, yeah I'm a little bitter. Here's what needs to happen. I yep. just this this idea just popped in my head. Mm-hmm. We need the trout bitten comp yeah on similar conditions mm-hmm. same creek mm-hmm split the rigs up you got thin micro standard everybody has see, to use see what the catch you like, will see who catches more fish do like five days in a row <laughs> and do it yeah five days in a row and then you'll have your conclusion well, it doesn't matter all right so that that's that's always the question like <laughs> hey do thinner leaders catch more trout Maybe sometimes certain certain right on <laughs> I, I, uh, well so bill you said it you know you set up your water conditions there you said it was skinny water and you had to stay further back i would use the standard rig i might choose to use this, continue to use the standard rig, tuck it in, lay the cider down for the first two seconds, let's say the first five feet of drift, and yeah. then I'll peel that cider off. <laughs> Austin likes this. Mm-hmm. And then I'll peel that cider off and I'll tight line the rest of the way. And I can't do that. I can't do that with a micro rig. Of course I can float the cider, but I can't get that nice tuck exactly how I want it. I'm not using a tuck to force the fly down either. It's about the alignment of everything. And it allows me to expand my range because I can do that even across seams. 
hmm, because I'm not going to cross seams. I'm actually going to get my, I'm going to have my tuck and then I'm going to lay my cider in exactly the same seam. All that stuff's totally possible with the standard build. And so there, whatever, you use to, you learn to use the tool that's in your hand. Another thing, Bill, in that same situation, when you were talking about whatever, six inch, eight inch water, right? Real skinny water, real bright conditions, maybe got to stay back. Yeah. You and I were talking not too long ago. We saw somebody saying like, hey, oh, hey, it's real skinny water. So oh, I'm out yeah. here using 8X with my uh, real light flies. Yeah. You know, if, if someone tells you you have to use 8X to get down in a foot of water, they don't understand what they're talking about. Like, if it's eight inches of water and it's skinny water, at that point, that eight inches of water has very little effect. Like your tippet is, it has very little effect on that unless it's at Mach 10 coming down the river. <laughs> but, you know, if it's, if it's at a standard flow, that 4X to 6X, there's probably, or even 8X, there's probably not a huge difference. And if you're, using that 8x it's it's probably just going to go straight to the bottom and you're going to hang up a lot more often and then you're not going to catch any fish that's the thing so you and i were talking about actually choosing 4x to slow the drop rate down yeah and if you put it in one seam there's not going to be drag right if you're crossing seams cause right because your casting is sloppy or you're getting lazy about wading into good position then that 8x is really going to help you i understand that but if you're really good at putting everything in one seam you could use 4X to slow the drop rate down. Again, this, this tracking concept, one of the first things we were talking about, if you're just trying to have less influence to the flies and have a like a long glide on the way down, just a long fall, a long unaltered fall, you're trying to have almost no influence as those flies just gently fall to the bottom. You could use lighter flies and lighter flies. Then you're going 7X so you have less, less influence. And then you're going to say, well, I need an even lighter fly now. Now I 8X. Oh, now I need an even lighter fly. And that's kind of what I call the downward spiral of going. Yeah, you're just chasing your tail. Right on. You can do it the other way. You keep your number 14 rubber legs on there in that skinny water and throw 4X or hell 3X. At some point, it's too thick. But, you know, you could slow the descent with that thick <laughs> tip. shakes his head. No. It's totally, I mean. <laughs> it's never too thick. <laughs> Hey, no. It's totally the opposite of what people are thinking of these days, Trevor. But it's also like that surface area you're talking about that's accepting the force of the current, right? That's where it's not even just the straight drop. It's the fact that as that drift progresses, there's more surface area as sail to the current with a 3X tippet than there is with 8X, right? And so you're getting more pull and that's going to have a, a buoyant, effect on the flies so that they aren't just dropping straight to the bottom it's it's more about that it's it's not just the straight descent right through the water but it's also the ongoing effect of the current on that which is i think what you're saying but it is i think, I think what, the thing to be yeah. careful there is you don't cross in seams with that right mm -hmm. that sure. you can get that nice pool but it's coming down one uh, hope for sure in one lane Yep. So you got to be careful about how much of that, the angle basically of your yeah, cider and how absolutely. much of that tippet's in the water. All right. And I think that's where sort of the, uh, the experience or whatever comes in and really mm -hmm. knowing what your goals are and sure. what the tool is in your hands. What are you, what are you capable of? That getting everything placed exactly how you want it is not possible. I mean, it is not always perfectly possible like that with the micro rig, like it is with the standard. Because the standard, the fly can go in and then that leader can continue to travel into some other place. Where do you want it? You know, that's, that's always the question for me. Sure. Whether it's after a fishing trip or at a backyard fire, you can bet the Trout Bitten crew has a case of new trail broken heels along with us. It's honestly our favorite beer. This hazy IPA is smooth and full-bodied. Hand-selected citra hops lead to notes of bright clementine and juicy ruby red grapefruit. Broken Heels is a keeper. New Trail Beer is proudly brewed in Williamsport, Pennsylvania and delivered cold to your favorite craft beer retailer every week. At New Trail, it's not about being the best angler. It's about getting out there. So enjoy nature's moments and reward yourself for a day well fished with New Trail Broken Heels. It's Trout Bitten's favorite beer. So here... This kind of goes to everything, and I think we've kind of touched on it, but any leader you fish, I feel like it has to have balance. And so I think of it as like a seesaw. 
let's say the the crossbar of the seesaw is your cider and so if you want to you know maybe have better better strike detection and just kind of have everything a little bit more balanced to me i feel like i try to balance out whether it be fly line whether it be a 20 pound butt section a 15 pound butt butt section try to balance it with the flies and think of it as like the the thicker butt section you have maybe you're not casting it as far and so there's not as much of it out of the guides versus if it's thinner you could cast it further but it all comes down to balance and it kind of goes back to like i think humphrey talked about having like the rosary bead of split shots yeah to counteract and so, the like, fly line to yeah. counteract the way to fly yeah. line and so it all comes back to like you have to have balance in your system like for that. it to work right bill shouldn't but shouldn't you point out you should always and maybe you disagree with this you should always make sure that your the conditions dictate the balance not the leader like just don't throw on mm. flies to balance out a leader when the conditions don't warrant it that's the opposite of what the way you should think that's you should nice. think how am i how are the conditions what what flies that's the most important thing what yeah. flies should i be fishing and then work backwards on the balance right. yes no i think I, yeah that's a i agree yeah, with that that's a nice addition think about what the fish are going to eat and then balance it appropriately yeah. is what you're saying yep same thing you're saying just in the reverse like thinking mm -hmm. yep. in reverse to get to that balance i agree with that i'll bring up another benefit of the micro rig i think it's uh most people would agree that it's more sensitive. Sensitive in the way that you can feel that. If you're tapping the bottom, if that's your goal while you're using a micro rig, you can feel it a little bit more, I think. Agree or disagree? I think mostly agree. I feel like the sensitivity is, is based on the relationship between the weight of what's at the end mm -hmm. and the connection point, though. Not necessarily just thinner equals more sensitivity. Agreed. Like I think that, that thinner is only sensitive if it's got enough weight at the end to to let, allow Good you point. to actually feel that Absolutely. just like just like the i think that you get almost maybe not identical but pretty dang close sensitivity with a standard mono rig as long as the fly is heavy enough heavy to enough. Mm -hmm. to still do that Doesn't 20 centigrams differ. 25 centigrams is where if you if you're less than that you're almost just not going to feel it on any rig even yeah, if it's i feel, I feel like, like 50 and above is like for the standard especially oh yeah yeah i also feel like like from a physics standpoint, I feel like mm. a stiffer medium would transmit sent, like vibration better. The, the fly rod does. A stiffer mm -hmm. fly rod absolutely is more sensitive <clears throat> in yeah. that way. That's yeah. what I was thinking, Trevor. Yeah. Was there's like we need a physicist on to tell us what is the what is the best medium to transfer energy? Is it right. a that's fair? Like, you know, like fluorocarbon and braid are more sensitive sure. than uh, nylon, right? Right. But if you right. talk to almost any gear fisherman, they'll say that lighter lines are more sensitive. Interesting. You, know, well, you would think like impacted. you would think that like a real uh, thick line maybe yeah. will transmit it better, but I think it also absorbs it, perhaps. Maybe. It being the bottom or the fish mm -hmm. strike. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Interesting, right? There's yeah, a couple different ways guess. to yeah. see yeah. The, the reaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else, guys? What did we miss? Uh, we missed a lot, I'm sure. I will say that my uh other hate towards micro thin leaders <laughs> is all of the uh gashes it leaves in my hands oh yeah I, I get cut like crazy fishing do you uh, i would say i would say like 12 pound and less and and it's i don't know if it's setting the hook a lot of times it's how i set mm. um i constantly cut the oh, sides of my pinkies cuts. i get them in the creases of my <laughs> I get, yeah, I yeah, I like the creases cuts. of my fingers do you? And hey, yeah. yeah, that's you interesting. Guys are soft. Get it all the time. Right? Austin and I don't have a problem. No, soft. Anymore. I set the hook like a man. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're catching all those ten-inch fish, bro. Those don't no, 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 cut. Back them. They don't cut it. I, you, you don't get. You don't get cuts, Austin. <laughs> no, I never get cuts. I you like the Seinfeld, the Seinfeld hands, don't you? You talking about your trigger <laughs> finger or your line hand, man? Well, my uh, line hand, Dom. Your, when your I set, stripping it's hand. just a, it's just, your stripping yeah, hand it's just how I hold it. Okay. My stripping hand. It's just how I, I end up pulling down. Um, I'm trying to look at my scars. <laughs> what what <laughs> hands like more prone? I don't. Maybe I'm sloppy with my uh, line management when I set and and like it flies. Yeah, I don't know. I cut all my all the time though. I cut no my kidding. hand on I think micro stuff. I, I make it seem like I fish micro stuff all the time. I don't, but when I do, I cut my hand. No kidding. 
I do get cut a lot with it. And I think it's because I fish longer distances. And so I have more of the line out. Mm. And so when I hook the fish and I start to strip, like I'm stripping down and it cuts yeah. me on my, like my stripping hand at the bottom of my pinky finger mm. because I'm stripping down and the fish is, is going out. So and micro so, leaders yeah. will also in the rain, they'll stick to the rod guides. We know that, that that's even, oh, it'll happen yeah. with the standard build, but it can get really bad with the micro also you know it'll wrap around the rod tip more but i want to say like those kinds of things and even like the fish fighting aspect and maybe getting knots in there more tangles and things like that or accuracy like all those things i feel like are very specific to the angler let's say they're all solvable like matt you could stop cutting your hands if you actually cared about fishing a micro mono rig you can get some fish you change some finger condoms right (laughs) little finger condoms you'd be all right like you could make it work, right? Just like I think when everybody starts fishing any mono rig system, they go, man, it's wrapping around the rod tip and the micro is even worse. But we all get used to all of those kinds of things. Just like the accuracy for me really cleaned up, I don't know, after a month or so of fishing it so many years back. And I was like, okay, I got it now. And you get better at it. I, I feel like those are almost, they're not incidental, but they're solvable. But some of the stuff we're talking about, there are clear advantages and disadvantages. It's just like the, a big disadvantage of the standard build is that sag. That's what it always comes back to. It wants to sag, so it wants to drag. Yeah, You can defeat that. You can be disciplined about your distance. You can use that power, which we've talked about. You can do all those things to kind of compensate. You can float the cider a little bit. There's so many different ways. You, you get used to the tool in your hands. It likes to tangle on stuff in front of you too. Like Bill, you and I were fishing on Saturday and we were talking about this, that the thinner yeah. the material, kind of the more uh, flexible it is and mm. the more freely it, it likes to fall <laughs> into inconvenient crevices and, and zippers <laughs> and anything else in front of yeah, you. <laughs> I would yeah. agree with that. It's and, annoying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's worse than a thicker dimer to butt section that maybe is stiffer and is less prone to falling into those areas. Just to be more conscious. Also solvable, but happens. Let me set up one more thing before we get out of here. Because I get this question. If you had just one leader or one system, describe how you would do this. If you had to just use one leader to tight line with a number 16 bead head, which I'm going to say is 15 centigrams. 12, 15 centigrams. Uh, what would it be? Like a 2.5 millimeter bead. Okay? Are we on the same page? Mm-hmm. So that's the weight you have. Or you had to choose a leader to fish just that weight. I don't know. How would you do it? What's your What's your rig? How far away? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, right? what water? Were those beads on sale? What time of Is year? Is that why you only have one? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. No, what time? That's right. There's always variables. All right, 28 <laughs> feet away, and it's summertime, and the water's low and clear. Okay. It's flat. It's flat. What? Eh, not totally flat. You got a little. You got a little glide there. Do an eight pound butt section of amnesia, whatever that breaks down to. Okay. Butt section. How are you casting? How many how many lead wraps do I have? None. None. <laughs> <laughs> I'd add split shot to be honest. That's what I'd do. If I wanted to use a stand, you, whatever. Anyway. You didn't say split shot was an option. No, I'm that that's fair. That's fair. I think I'd go microliter. I mean, that's a good situation. Yeah. I think it'd be a fun situation in which to use the microliter. And some mm-hmm. of it's because it would be novel to me too. But I think you're, we've talked about this before. As you get further away, mm-hmm. you minimize some of the advantages and of if you're just trying to dead drift a nymph without a suspension device, you mm-hmm. minimize the disadvantages of that microliter. Um, so I think at 28 feet, I think you could get a pretty dang good drift with an eight pound micro liter. Mm-hmm. I mean, nice. again, like we, yeah, there's so many variables right. that would make me choose off the dry. Say, give me, give me a four mile an hour breeze. And all of a sudden I'm picking the standard. Nice. Wouldn't take much. You'd have to. I'm dropping mine off a dry. I'm on my standard rig, dropping it off a chubby. Mm-hmm. That's a great <laughs> solution. You could float the cider yeah. too. I kind of mentioned that earlier. That's what yep. I would do if I if I didn't want to change leaders. And if I did go to the six pound or eight pound micro, you'd, you'd have to be surrendering to water hall on it, which would be okay. You'd, I'll do that off and on. Anybody else on that one? Austin, what would you do? He's left-handed. He doesn't count. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm left-handed. You know, don't discriminate against me. Uh, maybe a 10 pound. <laughs> okay, he's going to split the difference. <laughs> he's like, I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know what I'd do. Yeah. Josh, what do you have? 
I'm calling him in. I'm calling him in. He was reading something else. Seven X tip it all the way. Seven X all the way. <laughs> Unweighted wall tournaments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah water hall yeah he's just gonna look at that wall tournament it's just gonna get out there gonna... <laughs> anything else guys i mean i don't think no, i think I re- it's I uh, a bunch right. of stuff to talk about Do we well, talk about advantages very much advantages of micro leader i feel yeah, like i mean we i think a lot of them talked there. about it you right. got another one no i'm just just making a point further are away trying to, are you trying to stand up for the micro Leader? I think we've done that. Yeah, I don't want to be elitist. No, I feel like we've done that. We've talked about right. further away, obviously, being out of contact. It's easier to, I mentioned that two or three times. It's easier to have less influence w- w- with your fly if the whole setup is real light. Don't you think if you're fishing the light leader, Austin, you're an automatic elitist? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that should put you into that category, right? Automatic. Or sheep. What's ironic is th- that leader should, you, should really put you into knuckle dragging territory. <laughs> Ooh. But it actually elevate it to to some minds. It elevates you to some right. elite level because it's so much harder or advanced, which it's not. I will say that it is. I'm confident saying it's completely alien out here. Mm-hmm. Remember we were talking east west oh, yeah. stuff, right? Yeah, right. Hundred percent alien out west right now. Mm-hmm. I don't even think people would understand what a micro leader is. Mm-hmm. Like. Mm-hmm. I've seen the tight line th- tight lining in general catch on, uh, contact nymphing, whatever you want to call it, but micro thin leaders not so much yet. It, I'm sure it'll come. Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't you know? necessarily apply to your water so much. Right. Not as much. There's some spring creeks out here. Sure, I can sure. See, Good point. You know. Yeah. So here's a question: We talk about versatility, right? Yep. So what is the absolute thinnest leader where you feel like you mm. don't like have that. to sacrifice versatility? Right. 12-pound chameleon. Yeah, I was going to say 12. Agree, 12. And there's still some sacrifice, but... Minor sa- Like, there's minor on either end. <laughs> yeah. I'd back that up, 12. That mics out at a 1-3, just for reference. Because 12, you know, the, the, the poundage doesn't matter as much as the diameter and the stiffness of yeah. the material. So What's, Is amnesia thinner or thicker? A little thinner. But again, you and I talked about how it's um, harder, yeah. harder to measure uh, because it's or an oval line. Yeah. Dom, when you rattled that off, all I could think of was Leroy Jenkins. Who's that? You, remember that? you never saw the Leroy Jenkins video when he's like, they're uh, YouTubing in, in a, in a, like a, one of those role playing games where they're all in a room and they have their headsets on and they're like, some guy's computing something like 0.03 and Make one dude just says, <laughs> I'm going in. <laughs> Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> you, you never saw that? No. Oh, You're going to have to send, I'll, I'll send it to, it to you That's guys. Right. Yeah. That's right. I don't know. I'm a nerd about this stuff. Yep. Dude, you'll lose your I like on this video. That's right. <laughs> I'm telling you, I could do 10 podcasts on this and, and be happy. I, yeah, I love I this could stuff. keep talking about this. Do you want to hit anything else or should we get out of here, Bill? Nah. <laughs> Trevor's ready to go to bed. <laughs> I'm tired. All right. There it is. How we fish various mono rig leader builds and how different tight line leaders actually increase or restrict your options on the water. So in this two-part podcast, we've tried to emphasize how dramatically different these leaders are. In truth, it's confusing to hear someone refer to a mono rig or a tight line leader and not define the type. That's how far we've come. Just like there are many different types of fly lines with floating, sinking, intermediate, and more, and even the drastic difference in performance and application between an eight-weight and a two-weight fly line, so too the specific monorig build matters a lot. It always comes down to a balance between more power or less sag. Thicker leaders lend more power and punch, if you cast them that way. But they also sag more. The thinnest leaders have no ability to push anything around, no power. So they rely on the weight of the fly or split shot to make the cast. They have no power, but they sag less. But another consequence of less power in a leader is how such leaders can handle an indicator. Running a tight line to the indicator setup is a key part of what many of us do out there because it is so much more effective in water where we cannot wade into great position to keep the nymphs tracking toward our rod tip and in one seam. A standard mono rig build has the power to push a yarn indie around, for example, and the leader can even be mended once it's on the water, just like a fly line. But the micro rig, having no mass and no power, must rely on the weight of the nymph, the split shot, 
or a bobber to get an indicator rig to the target. And that is a very different thing. Remember, everything works sometimes. Also, here's another point about the versatility of the standard build. If I'm fishing the standard and I'm wishing for a lighter, thinner leader, it's very easy to just extend the standard cider with 1x, 2x, or 3x bicolor, maybe thinner. I often add two feet. Sometimes I add four feet. But you can extend with as much length as you want, really. Because for every foot of skinny material that you add to the cider, there's a foot less of the thicker butt section that is out of the rod tip, possibly causing sag on the same length of cast. Now that's a big deal because it allows me to do micro-rig things with a standard leader build. I do this a lot, and I've described how I work with this in a Troutbitten article titled Design and Function of the Troutbitten Standard Mono Rig. So we can do that with a standard. We can easily make it thinner, but we cannot do it the other way around. We can't make a micro-leader thicker. It is what it is in that butt section. And that's another good example of the versatility of one rig and the pure specialization of another. Now, Josh and I filmed a full video on these differences between micro and standard. I've also published key articles that break down these points further than we've done in these couple hours of conversation here. So be sure to find links to all of those resources in the show notes. So to wrap all of this up, the real question at hand is this. Do thinner leaders catch more trout? No. No, they do not. And the angler who navigates through these, who learns the tools, is the one who catches more trout. On the other hand, the micro-thin version solves a few on-stream problems in ways that are a struggle to duplicate with the standard leader. Now, each leader design also requires unique refinements and casting style to make it perform well. Some educators tell you a micro-thin mono rig is more advanced, but I disagree with this. I don't see a leader as offering any advanced tactic that we should graduate into. There is no hierarchy here. These leaders are all just different tools for drifting flies. So learn to use them well, with an open mind and a curious nature, and you'll happily find what works best for you, for your waters, for your preferences, every day on the river. That's about it. Matt Grobe, will you read us out? You got it. Remember, the Trout Bitten Project is a free resource for all anglers. The Trout Bitten website hosts over a thousand articles with endless stories, commentaries, tactics, tips, and more. Find what you like through the top menu and through the search page. Navigate by way of the categories and tags too. Be sure to find the Trout Bitten YouTube channel, now featuring the Trout Bitten Tip Series, the Fish and Film Series, and the Trout Bitten Fly Box, all in collaboration with Wilds Media. Thank you for listening to the Trout Bitten Podcast. Please give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leave a comment, because that really helps. Until next time, friends, fish hard, enjoy the day, and find your life with a microliter on the water. <laughs> <laughs> he loves it. That's good. They're not the same. You need an ultralight. Yeah. Super micro. <laughs> Super micro. Hyperlight. Disappearing micro. Invisible. <laughs> Invisible micro. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that's beyond micro. Yeah, because you're a jerk and you texted me. <laughs> that's a really good one. And I can't do that. That was soft. I set the hook like a man. Fish naked. Hashtag. Uh, I'm left-handed. Leroy Jenkins. <laughs>